From the early and mid-2000s, while homemade gaming videos were first appearing, game life remains prominent as one of the few that was able to garner and maintain attention. In spite of its rudimentary production values, it helped shape the structure and style of gaming content to come, especially on YouTube. Even so, most people have forgotten of its existence, and only a few traces of it remain on the internet, with much discussion of it deleted and unarchived over the years. So what was game life, and why did it disappear? To help elucidate this topic, video producer Larry Bundy Jr. has agreed to offer his skills and knowledge. Hello you! I'm Guru Larry. You may recognise me from the internet in various forms over the years, but I'm probably best known nowadays for my series Fact Hunt, where I look at humorous, stupid, and downright bizarre drama and anecdotes from the history of video games. In one of my previous episodes, I touched on the rise and fall of the internet show Game Life. While the name may not be all too familiar to the current generation of YouTubers, they were one of the first channels to have exploded in popularity. But their monumental rise and disastrous fall in just a few short months deserves expanding beyond what I posted in my original video. So I thought, why not leech off Frederick's popularity in a shallow, blatantly desperate attempt to gain views from my stagnating channel? And so, I welcome you to Down the Rabbit Hole. By the year 2000, professional content focused on video games had established itself as a core part of the gaming community, especially magazines, and with the World Wide Web gaining popularity, new publications would appear online to provide more up-to-date gaming coverage. These online resources were known for their amateur production value and tone, something that appealed to their niche readers and viewer base, and this sort of tone would soon help influence young gamers to create their own content. These early content makers established what we know as gaming videos today, such as Sean Baby heralding a sense of humour to gaming with his sharp, sarcastic wit, magazine-style review shows such as Game Rooms starring Mark Bustler and that other bloke no one can remember the name of, as well as the dry Scottish wit of Rab Florence and Ryan McLeod's Consolvania. But of course, the biggest impact of all would be the angry Nintendo nerd from 2004 onwards, whose style brought nearly a decade of endless sweary clones spouting their vitriol towards whatever NES game perturbed them that week. Though out of this early tsunami of Tourette's-infused videography, a more humble, even family-friendly show arrived. A show that reviewed the classics and would promise you your daily dose of gaming goodness, despite being only released monthly at best. In late 2005, a group of college-aged friends released a video entitled Game Life Episode 1, reviewing games in a loose, disorganized format. The main host, Andrew Rosenblum, introduced the show, wobbling on screen with staggered speech and heavy breathing. Hi, welcome to the premiere episode of Game Life, the show where you can get your daily dose of gaming goodness. I'm your host, Andrew Rosenblum, alongside my partner, Alex Lazar. Today on the show, we have a whole slew of Nintendo content to get to. The show was filmed on a home camcorder, without the assistance of a tripod and using only the overhead lighting of the room. In the first segment, co-host Alex Lazar would review the game Medios for the Nintendo DS, but due to both technical limitations and the method of recording, the game was almost impossible to see. What's more, Alex would mumble heavily and leave long, quiet gaps in his speech, making few qualitative assessments in his review. So as you can see, the planet that you had to destroy is on the top screen, and and like the puzzle is on the bottom screen, and you use a stylus to control it. To line up three lines, three colors horiz horizontally or vertically. And um, yeah. And the cool thing is that after you line up all in colors, you can. Uh, oh, damn it. Immediately afterwards, Andrew would review a DS game of his own, the screen's even more difficult to see than in Alex's segment, and his description of the game only gave a vague sense of its gameplay. Now, the whole game is lining up three of the same color, right? Pretty easy. Now, just like I did right there. Um, 
These problems manifested throughout the rest of the video as well, with the camera only recording part of the screen for Andrew's review of Shadow of the Ninja. Basically everything. Um... Now, an excellent part about this game is how it has um, a lot of platforming elements in it, and there's more guys in the game. The music consisted of remixes of various video game soundtracks, often from recognizable Nintendo properties, which was mixed loudly in comparison with the hosts' voices and would often make it difficult to understand their slurred, mumbling speech. The disadvantage of the, way the wireless controller compared to the normal controller is that the wireless system have a rumble, which kind of people will miss out on, but I'm sure Nintendo knew that to save battery life, it had to ditch the, the rumble feature, so... With the advent of consumer-grade, affordable video equipment, making personal shows had become a common form of household entertainment. Like many similar shows on the internet at the time, Game Life was produced with very little forethought, and it's unlikely that they intended it to be viewed by anyone outside of their close circle of friends, and perhaps a few other people online. Other shows such as the AVGN and Game Room had established a level of professionalism by this time. Though this could be argued it was because of their previous experience in film school and television. Game Life had none of this background. So, in an ironic twist, the amateurish, low quality look of Andrew and Code's videos strangely did give it its own charm, its own character even. The rudimentary format of the show hit viewers with a hey I could do this vibe that made it a lot more approachable than others at the time. It's not certain where Game Life was first posted, but based on what little evidence remains, it seems to be that their first home was Google Video, an early video streaming service released before the boys from California bought YouTube. But while a small group may not have had great plans for their content, the internet was already pushing it viral. While the numbers are lost, it appears that Game Life gained a remarkable amount of attention compared to other shows of the time, and people were hopeful for further installments. The feedback was mixed, but even so, the show was so successful that the crew decided to create their own website for the burgeoning series, advertised in text in the corner of the screen in the second episode. This episode also moved their friend Dave Cohen from behind the camera to in front of it as a core host. Almost a direct port from the PlayStation 2 version. The PlayStation Portable version is missing commentary and a graphic card. But the positive feedback was characterized by more than a large viewership. Inspired by the antics of the first episode, it wasn't long before the Game Life team were receiving audition tapes from all corners of the internet. Notably, one of these were from the gaming website Screw Attack, who were rejected allegedly because they were not big enough for them. Hey everybody, I'm Stutter and Craig. And Handsome Tom. From Side Scrollers on ScrewAttack.com, and welcome to the video game vaults. Now, Craig, we're actually in our. Two other audition tapes, however, certainly stood out to the crew. The first was from a 16-year-old named Jeff Mendocino, who, on a whim, submitted his own segment, featuring his eccentric personality. Work on this two little bits, but it's definitely a milestone in video gaming as of today. <laughs> Mario Kart sucks! <laughs> the second was Melissa, whose segment showcased the professionalism beyond that of the core cast. She's just accompanied by her magical parasol, which is handy for whacking baddies, scooping up items to throw, and floating over great divides. Impressed by these two, Andrew decided to include their segments in the second episode of Game Life, which was quite the achievement for the time. While Jeff with his wackiness and Melissa with her assets were originally only meant to be guest presenters, their popularity with the viewers granted them a permanent place in the halls of gaming goodness. By the release of Episode 3, gaming publications both print and online were taking notice of them and their rising popularity. In a special agreement with the magazine Electronic Gaming Monthly, all five hosts were flown out to the 2006 Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, where video game producers would present their upcoming games for both consumers and stockholders. It was here that they would all meet for the first time. 
They interviewed multiple developers and asked them simple questions about their games while also playing some for themselves and offering their thoughts, and they, in turn, were interviewed by gaming publications. The most infamous of these was the One Up Show's interview, where it seemed like the interviewer was teasing the team. The door. Right, everybody kick, come on, let's all yeah. kick. Kick. Uh, come on. <laughs> come on, kick. Game left. Kick. Come on, Dave, what are you doing? Don't hold on to me, Dave. Why? Come on. <laughs> tell you. All right, guys, go well. But even though the viewers may have seen a unified and positive crew, disagreements regarding the show's future were already surfacing. As the series progressed, Andrew's goals and ego were beginning to grow in equal measure. His constant dissatisfaction with his own show led him to neurotically demanding ever higher quality to compete with media way out of his budget and league, while endlessly criticising his co-hosts. I personally believe that Andrew kind of took the show like really, really seriously and he tried controlling things that other people might not have been so easy to relinquish control of. And that started building up to the point that the, the fun of making a Game Life episode was not exactly as I remembered it being. So Andrew was kind of going around, like kind of feeling like, you know, oh, Game Life is just going up, up, up. Uh, I I can like pull whatever uh, fun stuff off and then I'm going to be adjusting this to be more professional like the real shows and stuff like that. It's like, oh, dude, come on. Like what made Game Life Game Life was the 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 in your face sort of like no production value, <laughs> you know, though the presenters continue to work together, albeit in a rather tense relationship. Disagreements about the show's production were threatening to split the cast. During the fifth episode, Dave threatens to leave entirely in an obviously scripted segment resembling a WWE sketch, and Andrew would later put out a call on their website for people to send in audition tapes to replace him permanently. And you know what? That's fine, but I got two words for you. I quit. Wow! Uh, that was unexpected. But, you can find some clues about Dave's disappearance on Game Life by going to www.gamelifeshow.com and checking out what's happening there. And at least me and Alex will see you next time on Game Life. Concerns about his departure were quickly assuaged when he returned at the beginning of the following episode, completing what appeared to be, on the surface, a skit done for fun. However, behind the scenes, there was genuine fear that Dave would actually walk off the show due to the mounding creative differences with Andrew. I remember at E3, uh, Andrew uh, unfortunately would get like pretty agitated with Dave, and as time went on, it actually ended up being kind of a like a real thing to the point that like Dave leaving, like quote unquote leaving the show, was actually a, not it. At that point, they kind of made up. Um, and you know, it was just like the WWE sort of like, I'm leaving and blah, 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 and all that stuff, right? But these will not be the only issues to assail this ragtag team of misfits. While their popularity was growing and they were fostering a dedicated fan base, negative attention was being directed towards them as well. The show had been regularly criticized for its low production value, but as they grew more popular, rumors began spreading about them based on a set of images involving Melissa and an unidentified man, someone assumed to be her boyfriend. On May 18th, some users on the NeoGAF forums began investigating. One forumite, in his own blog, wrote, on NeoGAF, in this thread where the news first hit the fan and where I've gotten most of my information and leads for this story, people have finally begun to ask about the connection between Melissa and the rest of the Game Life guys, and all the little details such as the time frame in which she entered the picture. Many have begun to suspect that she may have seen an opportunity to latch on to an up-and-coming internet fad and sought to squeeze herself into the picture to perhaps further her career, which in this case is hers or her possible boyfriend's sub-art school grade photography? I for one agree with this scenario. And if true, I'd be extremely upset since it would be yet another female that has to use and abuse the look at me, I'm a hot chick that plays video games shtick. 
It's women like her that gives real girls that enjoy video games another reason to groan and keep their interests in the closet, and the fact that dumb, lonely, horny guys are all too eager to empower them." End quote. As time went on, Melissa would receive the brunt of the abuse, specifically accusing her of being a fake gamer girl, despite her demonstrated ability and interest in the hobby. But the real fun is in the Japanese imports. <laughs> But none of this would slow game life's progress, and that same month, a major announcement was made. They had been approached by MTV to produce one minute long reviews for a section on MTV 2's television show, The G-Hole. This made them one of the first, if not THE first, web show to receive a spot on television. Unfortunately, these videos aren't being hosted on MTV's site anymore, and it's likely that the only remaining copies exist as rotting VHSs in someone's basement. Other people were submitting their own segments during this time, likely hoping to receive some of the attention that the show had, and a few of these hopeful hosts had their clips used in the show. Hello, I'm Mr. Sampo, and today we will be learning how to fix your NES. That's right. Over the next few months, as they continued to produce episodes, gaming publications would seek them out and write about them. For example, the opening lines to a piece published in August for The Phoenix reads bemusedly, quote, Andrew Rosenblum is short and round, and his glasses seem ever so slightly to enlarge his eyeballs. He speaks haltingly in a nasal voice, and when he laughs especially hard, he doubles over in small convulsions. David Cohen is tall and round, with sleepy eyes and big rubbery jowls. He has a sonorous voice, but talks with a slight speech impediment not unlike the one that afflicted Edgar Stiles on 24. Alex Lazarb is very thin and his skin is pale, almost translucent. He has a shy smile and he speaks very softly. These guys are not, by any conventional definition, leading man material. But they get paid to be on MTV, and you do not. A writer from Electronic Gaming Monthly would eventually sit in on the recording session for episode 6, where he was introduced in the outro and his upcoming article was advertised. Well, as a matter of fact, it's Electronic Gaming Monthly's Robert Ashley. Hello. You can see us in EGM very soon, and you can find out when that will be at our website at www.gamelifeshow.com. And remember, it's not just life, it's GAME LIFE! Released in the September 2006 edition, the article speaks about them in largely favorable ways, describing them as unapologetically amateur, but it also revealed a few details that had only been guessed at up to this point. The opening mentions that the Gamers Lounge, the space used to record the show, was the basement of Andrew's parents' house in the suburbs of Boston. Melissa's segment in the article revealed that she was a private gourmet chef, though it would conspicuously leave out her surname at her request. She stated that, quote, I get enough death threats as it is. As time wore on, the show's style continued to grow more professional by degrees, with voices recorded separately from the video to help normalize the audio, and a camera method that captured games in a clearer way, though they never graduated to using a capture card to record gameplay directly. However, Andrew's vision just wasn't in line with his abilities. After all, he was just a kid with a camcorder by his own admission. As Andrew grew stricter about his demands for the show, Jeff pushed back hard enough that something had to give. It was it was during this point, um, I was the whole 16 years old at this point. It's a big boy, I could actually drive without my dad in the car, <laughs> stuff like that. Basically, what had happened was that I missed a, a month of game life because I was dealing with a, a number of personal things. I was overwhelmed with uh, volunteer work at uh, one of my mom's uh, nonprofit organizations and stuff like that. And I just really, really didn't have time. And if I didn't have inspiration to make an episode, it was actually like, you know, it was really hard. It was kind of like, I want to have fun thing. Uh, unfortunately, I do remember Andrew did not take that too lightly. and. Uh, you know, uh, words were exchanged, one thing led to another, and I ended up just being like, I, I can't do this anymore, um, <laughs> I gotta focus on my studies and stuff like that. 
After this, Jeff would officially abandon his venerable position and fly off into the sunset, to be replaced with his friend Alex Biddle for episode 9. This didn't change the fact that Andrew just didn't have the skills to make what he wanted, and this was exemplified by episode 10, where Game Life covered two separate console release parties. Melissa's cameraman was fairly steady, and her audio was clear and crisp, while the main cast's recordings featured static that mimics the relaxing ambience of a heavy rainstorm. But then, quite suddenly, game life would end for good. At the beginning of the school year in 2006, Andrew had begun dating a woman, but after three dates, she decided to end their relationship. Soon afterwards, Andrew began harassing her through email and instant messaging, perhaps emboldened by his success with game life. This apparently continued for months until his harassment culminated in a series of emails on April 16, 2007, the night of the Virginia Tech school shooting. He wrote, quote, I'm gonna fucking bring a gun to your school and kill you and Kay and everybody you love. It's gonna be VT all over again. Seriously, I'm just that demented. Killing people can change people's lives forever. The best is in the end when I pull the trigger on myself, too. End quote. The woman reported Andrew's emails to the police, who promptly arrested him. After his arraignment, he had a tracking bracelet placed on his ankle, was held with bail set at $50,000, and was placed under house arrest with his parents for the next two years. Unsurprisingly, every company that had been attached to Game Life quickly disowned them. But at least they still had their deal with MTV, right? Well, about that. As soon as MTV caught wind of Andrew's threats, they frantically started messaging gaming news sites attempting to distance themselves from the show, stating, quote, Game Life's Andrew Rosenblum contributed two review segments last year to the MTV.com show The G-Hole, which is actually posted by Blair Herter. MTV does not own Game Life, nor does MTV have a video game show entitled Game Life. In addition, Andrew Rosenblum has never hosted a show for MTV. Game Life is a completely separate entity from MTV. All of this mass media attention was thanks to an anonymous tipster, and was totally not an act of revenge by ScrewAttack's stuttering Craig, whose segment had been rejected by Andrew. No, 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 no. And so, it was game over for Game Life, and any future that the show may have had was prematurely ended. Each of the members would go their separate ways. Melissa had already done a single video segment on her own for Destructoid as a part of Game Life, and it seemed likely that she could build her own career in game reporting. She would eventually join Dave in an attempt to create a new show called Dave's World, but for one reason or another it was cancelled, and no trace of it can be found online. After Game Life, Alex would apparently take on no new online projects, and both he and Andrew faded from the internet. Jeff, however, was able to leverage his experience with Game Life to work his way into the industry, first as a game reporter, then as a tester, and finally working his way to a production position, where he remains to this day. Even with the show's limited run, Game Life remains as a reminder of the early days of online video, where anybody could produce content and have their opportunity to gain popularity. But it also offers an important lesson to content creators to be wary of overreaching, and to maintain humility even when prospects seem to be at their best. Um, Andrew, if you're out there, I love you. Come back, buddy. In, uh, when was it? December 2005, I remember my years for some reason. Game Life had already posted their first episode, and it was this 45-minute, and for lack of a better word, a little bit of a train wreck. Uh, and it was just like uh, cameras pointed at, at DS screens with glare, and nobody could really tell what was going on. I'm like, this is the best thing in the world. So being that I was 15, I was super ambitious and not jaded by age or something like that. So I decided, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and shoot my own little segment. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and submit it to the guys. They saw it and they somehow liked it. Not sure why. Uh, but it was my Halo 2 segment in episode 2. They ended up uh, just adding me as a guest member that ended up being a tournament member later on. It, it was incredible. I didn't know the guys before. Uh, I, nobody knew uh, 
me at all. I just randomly just shot a video. I've, I've never really done videos or anything before. That actually just started my, my whole uh, let's make videos for fun thing. For Jeff the character, he was a... His personality changed from from episode to episode because it was more about like, hey, you know, let's let's do something kind of weird and and I guess appropriately shocking for game life, you know, like because you have you have this wonderful crew over here with varying personalities. You had Melissa, you had Andrew, you know. Let's just put um, someone who is probably a little bit crazy on the side over here. So I, I decided it was a, a funny fit, and way back then, I thought it was funny. When I look at it now, I just, I kind of wince away and look away from the screen, but, um, but yeah, my inspiration was basically, like, I...